Well, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of New Mexico Mercury. I'm here today with State Senator Jerry Ortiz Pino, who's, uh, who's been a longtime advocate for mental health services in New Mexico, possibly over 40 years. We're here to talk about probably one of the most chilling privatization scandals ever to hit our state, in which the Martinez administration appears to be using a private audit, which no one is allowed to see in detail, to wreck 15 local mental health providers who treat about 85% of the state's Medicaid patients and behavioral with uh, behavioral addictive disorders and replace those organizations with for-profit firms from Arizona. Senator Ortiz Pino is, is a keen observer of these matters, and we're really, really glad to have you here today with us and look forward to asking you some questions and hear what you have to say about this stuff. V.B., I'm really looking forward to this discussion, too, because this topic is, I think, hard for a lot of people to get a handle on, and yet it's so critical in so many lives, and it really will change the way the state functions for many years to come, long after this administration has forgotten what they're doing now could be plaguing us. So if this future plague has its genesis now, um, it must have something to do with, with what you wrote in, in, uh, in your column in the Mexico Compass. Um, you said that this move looks like, quote unquote, a slick movida to privatize our whole mental health system. Could you reflect on that a bit and tell us uh, something about the earlier audits that found these 15 organizations clean of any malfeasance or, or mismanagement or fraud. Yeah, that's that's really the key issue here, that uh, 15 of our most crucial behavioral health providers in the state, as you mentioned, the 15 that, that are the largest, that provide almost 90%, as a, as a revised figure I've heard recently, of, of what was going on in the state at this current time, or before this audit hit, uh, were described by the Secretary of the Human Services Department, Secretary Squire, Sydney Squire, as being, um, oh, I think she said, uh, uh, outrageous, fraudulent, uh, corrupt. She used a whole series of really powerful, slanderous, I think, terms to describe them as a result of an audit that was done by an outside company from Massachusetts, which was brought in specifically to look at these 15 programs this year. These are the same 15 programs that have been audited every year since managed care began in New Mexico. Every single year, the state of New Mexico has gotten audits on these 15 providers. And up until now, all of them passed those audits. Her claim is that suddenly, or either suddenly they've turned fraudulent on us, or somehow this company from Massachusetts has been able, through their clever computer program, to detect fraud that was going on all along but that nobody ever knew about before. Wow. And, and this, is, this, this stretches the, the uh, ability of the human mind to be credulous. I mean, this really is hard to believe. If you were a school teacher and every single kid in your class flunked a standardized test, I suppose you could say, boy, I must be a terrible teacher. Or you could say, has anybody checked this test? Maybe they gave the wrong test to our class. Maybe this is not a good test. It doesn't accurately reflect what's going on. If you were a baseball manager and every single one of your starters flunked the test for PEDs, you could say, boy, we really had a rotten group here. Or you could say, Maybe the test is wrong. Not everybody, you know, two or three <laughs> flunk it. Uh, then you might say, somebody's trying to make sure we don't win the pennant. Or somebody's trying to make sure our school gets an F grade. That's what I think is going on here. It just stretches my ability. The other thing here is, of course, I know these people, a lot of them. I don't know all 15 providers. But I know the ones that I've worked with over the years here in Albuquerque. Uh, these are these are long-term agencies. Long before Medicaid paid for behavioral health, they were struggling. Ogadis, Youth Development Incorporated, uh, Presbyterian Medical Services, which covers a lot of northern New Mexico, 
um, uh, El Mirador up in uh, uh, the Española area. Now it goes by the name of uh, Easter Seals, but it's still El Mirador. Uh, Program in Las Cruces, Family and Youth Incorporated, that I've known for 40 years. These are agencies who have struggled through the, the ups and downs of funding for behavioral health services. They've figured out a way to survive when they weren't getting reimbursed regularly, when they were, uh, in some cases, not able to get contracts renewed promptly. They survived somehow because they were committed to serving the kids and the families and the people of this state. Now, all of a sudden, they've all been labeled as fraudulent. God. They've all been called corrupt by the secretary, and she won't tell them why. To me, that's the most galling aspect of the whole situation, that, that's, that they've been called corrupt, their reputations are destroyed, and they will not be told why. As um, State Representative Mo Maesta said the other day at a, at a press conference, you, you don't have to, to uh, not reveal information in order to conduct an investigation. He says, I represent people all the time in criminal court, and 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 the you know uh, the investigation is going on, and we know exactly what we're charged with. Yes. It gives us a chance to to figure out whether there's a defense or not. These folks don't even know what they're being accused of. Much worse, the same person who's accusing them has found them guilty, called them corrupt, and then their appeal when they ask, well, is there anybody we can appeal to? Well, you can ask me if I'll find some good cause for you not to have your payments withheld. Anybody else? No, that's it. Just me. <laughs> so the whole thing is just... And then to blame Barack Obama for it. I mean, this is, this is the, the ultimate ironic twist in this whole situation. Why can't, you, why can't you keep the payments going while the investigation is going on, we asked her. Well... I could have before, but now under Obamacare, we're not allowed to do that. We have to suspend payments as soon as there is a uh, credible uh, allegation of fraud. Well, we read those regulations over. We sent a letter to Secretary Sibelius, our committee, Health and Human Services Committee, and we don't read it that way at all. It says the secretary may decide. She had great discretion. This gave her the ability, in a, in a really particularly egregious case, with one provider to stop it, if it's really that bad. Mm. But not when it's 50, not when it's 90% of the system, and to turn it over to friends of hers from Arizona who brought in. That's, I think, where it really is starting to, to, to take on uh, an ugly uh, tone of uh, true corruption, genuine corruption that's at work here, is not on the part of these providers, but on the part of a secretary who's making these kind of, of really bad decisions, hurtful decisions for our people in the state, and then making it possible for Arizona companies to make $18 million on the process. What I'm confused about, and I'm sure a lot of other people are confused about this, why isn't the state auditor involved in this? And why has the attorney general refused to reveal all of the details about these allegations? Two really good questions. The... Uh, the state auditor should have been involved from the beginning. It was our committee who asked the secretary, why aren't you involving the state auditor in this? She originally refused to let him see the results of this audit. Uh -huh. We had to, or well, he had to go to court and get a subpoena to pry it out of her hands. Ultimately, she's shared it with him. He's told us that he's going to look at this audit and make his own independent conclusions. It's curious that in North Carolina, when the same company, PCG, the Professional Consulting Group, one of those great corporate names, Professional Consulting Group, when they did an audit of the behavioral health system in North Carolina, they alleged that there had been $38 million or $36 million of fraud that they uncovered in, in, in North Carolina. Then the state auditor in North Carolina went over the same audit, the same findings, and he came up with a much lower figure, something like 3.8 million, a tenth of what they alleged. But at least he had a chance to do it. Our guy wasn't even going to be allowed to do it. So we asked the, the, the secretary, well, why isn't the state auditor involved? Doesn't he have to approve all contracts under our state auditor's law? He has the authority 
before a state agency can go off and hire some best friend to hire, a, you know, to bring in a, an auditor to to do an audit, they have to clear it with them. They have to show that this is a good firm, that this firm will do a good audit. That's not just state departments, it's school districts, local government. He has responsibility for the whole system. And he wasn't involved in this until after the fact. We think that's a clear violation. That's one of the issues we asked him to address. Unfortunately, he's up to his ears in his regular work, and so he says it's going to be November or December before he can get back to us with the finding. Dear God. So, you know, that's going to be too late, really, to save any of these agencies that are not getting reimbursed for that. By then, it'll be four or five months. The Attorney General is a, is a, is a real head-scratcher to me. I, I don't know why he's taken the stance he has now. I can surmise that he is, because he's announced that he's going to run for governor, he's particularly sensitive to appearing to be swayed by, by a partisan situation. This is an intensely partisan situation. It really is, and, and I'll explain why that's the case if you want. But, but, but I, I think he's bending over backwards, as it were, to, to avoid giving the impression that he's attacking the administration on this. He's trying to play it totally by the, by the rules. But I think he's made two huge mistakes. Um, the secretary alleges that it's when he accepted her data from the audit <clears throat> that that is when it was established that these allegations of fraud were credible. Oh, yes. We asked him about that, and he said, oh, no, no, she's the one who established the, the allegations being credible by her sending it over to us. Well, I think he's making a huge mistake there. He should have said, and I think th she's actually the more correct in this instance, that he could have accepted those allegations and uh, that she made, and then it's up to him to decide are these credible or not. Right. And so that would have made it impossible for her to cut off oh. the payments until he had made that determination. And he didn't have to wait, you know, till the whole audit was completed. He could have taken a real close look, because here's what I think is included in that in that pile of of allegations: misbillings, miscodings. In, 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 in incomplete paperwork or inaccurate paperwork, a lack of documentation, honest mistakes that should be caught, that should be changed, but that don't amount to fraud, along with possibly, since we don't know what's in there, some genuine allegations of fraud. But he could tell that within a week. All he has to do is have his, they don't have to, to you know, to make a whole lot of uh, investigation to decide if, look, 10% of these are allegations of fraud, the other 90% aren't. These four agencies had no allegations of fraud. Go ahead and keep paying them. He was the one who could have made the statement, I'll tell you when there's a credible allegation of fraud, not her. But he put that power in her hand. And I think that was a huge mistake. We're still struggling with that. We, we raise that issue in any number of letters that we've written to the feds trying to clarify for the Attorney General's uh, information that, that, that he's got it backwards. Um, unfortunately, he's been attacked by the administration for not being strong enough on Medicaid fraud. In New Mexico, Medicaid fraud is housed in his, in his office, right. the investigation and the prosecution of Medicaid fraud. And they don't have a sterling track record. I think he's really sensitive on this one. He does not want to misplay his hand. But I think in, in, in being as cautious as he's being, he's actually playing into the governor's hand and into Secretary Squire's hand. And I think he's wiping out our behavioral health system. In this enormously complex matter, with all kinds of timing involved and, and uh, Medicaid payments, in essence, being held withheld until punishment being meted out before a credible judgment has been made of a crime being committed, um, in all of this, um, you, you commented on this highly partisan situation. And, yes. I mean, it seems, it, it seems obvious that it is that, but I'm sure there's more to it than meets the eye, and I'd love you to explain that a little bit to us. To me, it is a partisan situation, and, and it's in this, in this, in this form. Um, I think it's two different visions of how government functions in providing services. 
And uh, in, in, in getting ready for this uh, interview today, I, I kind of went back over behavioral health in New Mexico and in the country since the 60s. Oh, and there's a real clear pattern there. When it's Democrats calling the shots, it's frequently a, a decentralized, community-based approach. The Community Mental Health Center Act under Kennedy and implemented under Johnson was really an effort at having uh, community mental health centers out in the community run by local boards, uh, uh, agencies with local boards who would have block grant money so they would be free of the, of the swings in, in, in favor that political elections could, could produce. That was the, the model that we were working on nationwide and in New Mexico up until the late 70s when, under Reagan, we went through a switch. And Reagan had a very different image. And since then, Republicans have, have more adhered to his image of how this should be done. This was, if you remember when Reagan was governor in California, he closed a lot of mental hospitals. He deinstitutionalized. He sent people out onto the streets but he didn't provide a whole lot of services out on those streets for them. And so we had a huge wave of people having to go to prison or jail for what were essentially behavioral health problems, addictions or, or schizophrenia or, or acting weird or looking weird or yelling things on the street. That would get you into jail. It's a different way of viewing it. And it really is, I think the Republican model is to privatize it, to corporatize it, give it to some company who can use marketplace uh, uh, dynamics to try to make it work to produce profit and to maybe do some good in the in the instance, and so we've seen you know the, the when Clinton came in we had this whole switch to let's use Medicaid to finance behavioral health. After the Reagan years and after the Bush years we swung over to the Clinton years and we used Medicaid, a lot more money all of a sudden available. In those years the, this would be the mid 90s. If you remember there were a dozen a dozen inpatient hospitals in Albuquerque for behavioral health. Wow. A dozen, you know, the Charters and the Heights and the, oh, and the right. Anna Casemans and the Vista Sandias. They've all vanished. Wow. The only one left now is UNM Hospital and maybe an inpatient ward or two, you know, a wing with maybe eight or ten beds in, in Anna Casemans. I mean, because once the Medicaid money was pulled out from them and it went into managed care, under the Republican administration, uh, Johnson, when he took over, and then under Bush's in the, uh, in the White House, the Bush years, that was all turned back. Instead of Medicaid being a payer, it went back to managed care. And okay, Medicaid was a payer, but it's not a fee-for-service. Now a company, a for-profit company, will tell you if you can provide that service or not. Now under Richardson, we swung back and we had mental health was carved out. It had its own managed care. Not great, but at least it, ha it had a, a, a fighting chance of getting some resources. Now under the Republican administration of Martinez, it's swinging back to the companies will tell you when you can get this care. Thank you. Call them up and find out if you can see that doctor, if you can go into that hospital, if your alcoholism really does require treatment, or if you know maybe you can get by with AA meetings, uh, something that won't cost us a lot of money. That, I think, is what we're swinging back to. It's the pendulum swinging ever more rapidly between two very different approaches to behavioral health. One is corporate profit first. The other one is services and nonprofits. All of these 15 agencies are nonprofits. All five of the Arizona companies coming in to take their place are for-profits. And the theory is that these for-profits will not commit fraud. I don't know if they will or not, but I do know they're not going to provide as much service yeah. as the nonprofits are because they're going to skim all they possibly can for their primary market or their primary audience, their stockholders. So who are these five Arizona companies? I've been hearing curious rumors, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I know they're rumors, and, uh, but that a certain, a certain U.S. senator who ran for president um, has a lot of money in his war chest left, and he's he's giving it to Republican candidates around the country to uh, to buy to buy services from from the companies of his state, which mm -hmm. happens to be Arizona. And I mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to get into those speculations or not. 
Yeah, I think I think there really is a connection with the partisanship issue here because um, we're we're still researching these Arizona companies. You know, we've got people trying to figure out have they made political contributions or not, or who's on their boards. Uh, um, do they have particular friends with any politicians in the past? And and some curious things are coming to light. But just not even <clears throat> knowing who they are, I would have. I would have figured that they would be doing better in Arizona under a Republican administration than they ever could have in New Mexico under a Democratic administration, just because wherever Republicans are running the behavioral health system, they're going to go to for-profit approaches. They're going to try to use market dynamics to hold down costs. Now, there's, and there's a real dilemma with that that I, want to, I don't want to lose that because I want to come back to that issue of whether behavioral managed care, behavioral health managed care is really an oxymoron or not. I think it is. Uh, it doesn't follow the same dynamics as primary care managed care. But aside from that, this is what they do. This is what Republican governors do. This is what Rick Perry's doing, Jan Brewer's doing, the guy in Wisconsin, the guy in Florida, the guy in Michigan, I'm sure. Wherever there's a Republican governor, they will try to turn the behavioral health system over to for-profit companies. In New Mexico, we had developed a network of nonprofits, private but nonprofit, who are actually providing the service. It's a different vision of it. These Arizona companies, I think, are basically trying to establish a foothold, a toehold here in New Mexico. They only have these contracts that they're signing, the $18 million contracts that they're signing, is only good for six months. It only takes us through the end of this calendar year, not the fiscal year. Because January 1, New Mexico switches over to something called Centennial Care, and the whole ball game changes. So this is $18 million for essentially six months' work that they're getting. Um, and I think it's, it's curious that several of the, of the board members of these for-profit Arizona, and I only know the names of, of two of the companies. One of them is called La Frontera, which started out 40 years ago. I, I visited La Frontera when I was starting a training program at uh, uh, the College of Santa Fe, a mental health training program. And, and National Institute of Mental Health suggested I visit La Frontera because they were a really gritty, grassroots group in Tucson. La Frontera started as a community mental health center. Over the years, it evolved into a for-profit. And that's one of the companies that's being brought in. The other one is a, an outfit called Agave. I don't know much about them. But I've, I've, been, I've been told that both of them have members on their boards who are very influential, very well-connected in the Republican Party in Arizona, which wouldn't be surprising given the reality that if you're going to have a contract in Arizona with government, Medicaid being a government-run program, you better have some connections that make sure you don't get into trouble over it. Then the other curious thing is we've heard, we were reminded that the governor's close advisor, uh, some people refer to him as the fifth floor governor, the one who really calls the shots on much of what goes on in this administration in New Mexico, uh, Jay McCleskey, that he got his start as a political consultant when he was hired as the head of the Arizona Republican Party, the executive director of the Arizona Republican Party. So I don't think it's terribly surprising that when they're looking for somebody to come in and take over, that they would turn to a Republican model, for-profit companies, and in a state adjacent to ours where they have a lot of friendly contacts. So that's why I think those five Arizona companies were picked. How they can get away with charging $300 an hour for their work running these agencies is a little head-scratching, but that's what they're getting. Each, each officer is getting 300 275, 250. It never dips below 250 an hour. That's a rate, I'll do the math for you, $600,000 a year rate. Now, they won't work 2,000 hours probably, but that's the rate at which they're being reimbursed for coming in and helping to destroy our current system. So, three obvious questions. Mm -hmm. One, how do you, a for profit company signs a contract with a state? for X millions of dollars. Uh, do they also charge for their services, or is that one, two? Uh, well, actually, I guess there's only 
two basic questions. Mm-hmm. Who audits the private companies? Yeah, the first question it really gets back to managed care, how managed care is structured. And these contracts, I believe, are structured the same way that um, 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 Optum's contract has been structured in the past. That is, the companies being brought in from Arizona to run these programs are not being paid uh, a flat fee. Optum still is in place. Optum is the company that we've hired for the last five years to manage the behavioral health system. They haven't gone away. They're the ones that audited all these uh, 15 providers over the years and found them to be doing just fine. Uh, But now all of a sudden, uh, they've been found by another audit to not be doing so well. But Optum hasn't gotten into trouble over this. They're supposed to be the the watchdog keeping an eye on the the property here, and they're going to keep on keeping an eye on the property, even though they turn out to have been asleep at the wheel if these allegations are correct. But... But these Arizona companies are coming in to work essentially for Optum, taking over the management of individual agencies. For example, um, the the one I'm familiar with is Team Builders, because that's the first one that, 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 that was taken over by an Arizona company here in Albuquerque. I guess one in in Las Cruces went even earlier, but, but the one that I'm familiar with is here in Albuquerque. And they came in and they kept the same office, they assumed the lease, they kept, tried to keep as much of the staff in place as they could, and it was just the management team for team builders that left, that as of a certain date were no longer in charge. I've got the, the contract with um, La Frontera Incorporated, which is an Arizona corporation, and um, they're going to be paid... No uh, compensation not to exceed their share of that eighteen million will be not less not to exceed four million seven hundred thousand seven hundred fifty thousand dollars, including gross receipts tax. So the state will pay the gross receipts tax for them. Um, their rates, the exhibit spells out what they're going to do. All they're going to do is provide all services that were previously provided by the behavioral health entity identified by HSD no later than seven days after receiving HSD's notice. So whenever an agency is, is, is going to be taken over, they get a week's notice and they come in and they take it over. And their executive director will be paid $300 per hour, the operations officer $275, the financial officer $275 an, office, an hour, the manager $250 an hour, the associate manager $200 an hour, the business analyst, 200 The system analyst uses computers, so it gets more expensive. 250 back to 250 The clinical leadership, 250 The transition consultant, 250 And the clinical trainers, $200 an hour. Wow. That's a team that's going to come in and work at Team Builders, at Ogadas, at YDI, wherever they take over an agency, and they're going to be paid those rates until they run out of their $4,750,000, which they only have to do that for the next six months. You know, this, this contract ends at the end of, of uh, December. So they'll spend it all. They'll get their, their four, four, point, you know, four and three quarter million dollar contract will be easily covered by that. And, and so, so it, they're, not, um, they're being hired basically as consultants to come in and run, as managers to come in and run this on a consultant contract, N- not, to, not to make decisions about which services to get or not. Optum will still be making those decisions. So does that mean that these Arizona companies are not only going to get these fabulous administrative salaries, but that they will also be re- reimbursed by Medicaid for working with patients? Yes, Optum still controls the, uh, the Medicaid behavioral health budget. So if If I was going, let's say last week, before uh, Team Builders was taken over, I was going to see a counselor at Team Builders to follow up on my uh, recent hospitalization for depression. Um, I would go see the counselor, and Team Builders would fill out a form at the end of it, send it in to Optum, and Optum would reimburse Team Builders for that unit of service when they made the checkout at the end of the month. It would include that unit of service. 
Optum still has that responsibility. Now the counselor will work for La Frontera or Agave instead of for team builders, but it'll be the same dynamic. So they don't, there's no necessarily, I don't think they have an incentive not to provide service because that's still a flow through Optum. But it, I think it creates a possibility for a real windfall for Optum. Optum has the whole ball of wax. They get a monthly check from the state and they distribute it around to these different agencies who are providing the services. Their, they have a, 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 their contract does not allow them to collect more than 15% or 18% um, for management and profit. The less they spend on management, the more they, spend, they, they have available as their share of profit. So I think this does create an opportunity for a windfall profit for Optum. Um, they're not going to be paying out as much as different uh, providers stop serving people. Uh, as, a, as, a, as a social worker working at, at uh, Team Builders decides, there's no future here. This thing ends at the end of December. i got to find a real job that will go on beyond that. I'll get a job with the schools yeah. or with the hospital or somewhere else, the state, another state department. And so they leave. There's not going to be any real incentive to, or even a possibility of hiring somebody for two months now, one month. And so what you're going to see is a real, over the last six months of this Optum contract, a real reduction in the amount of money paid out for services. There's just not going to be as much service money being paid out, which creates a bigger opportunity for Optum to make sure that their 18% includes everything they need in the way of profit. So <clears throat> where uh, does this... 18 million bucks that the governor is is going to give to these four or five Arizona companies come from? That's a wonderful question, and it actually is one that uh, some members of our committee, our Interim Health and Human Services Committee, asked the other day. And it turns out that they had to get a BAR, what's called a, a, a BAR, a budget adjustment, approved by the Legislative Finance Committee before they could do that. What it is, is they've saved so much money in their regular Medicaid budget that they had $18 million to shift from services to this contract. Now that's out of, keep it in perspective, that's out of a total Medicaid budget in this state of $4 billion. Medicaid in this state, in totality, not behavioral health, yeah. but all of Medicaid, including behavioral health, including long-term care, nursing homes, and all of that, is four billion dollars? It's 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 bigger than the schools at this point, but the difference is um, almost seventy percent of that money is federal money just flowing through, and so the state only puts up about twenty nine percent of that, or a little over a billion dollars is state money, and then three billion is federal money, and so they figured, and 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 I mean, it 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 kind of drives me crazy that they've saved eighteen million dollars that they've got that sitting there because they've been making all sorts of changes in the program, reducing reimbursement rates, holding down enrollments, doing all sorts of things that, that they claimed was because they didn't want to overspend the Medicaid budget. Uh -huh. And when push came to shove, halfway through the year, they were able to show that they had had, they have a free $18 million just floating there that they might as well shift to this thing. It, it, it's, it's, a, it's a manipulation of budgets, I think, is what's going on here. Do you think that the public uh, consulting group, the out-of-state audit, auditor, um, was chosen uh, because, as uh, the Mercury publisher, Benio Aragon, has written, uh, that every single stateside company they list as partners in business is either a member of or has an ongoing affiliation with ALEC, the notorious right-wing American Legislative Exchange Council, which relentlessly pursues privatization, privatization all over the country. I think that's really what's going on here. That is, this is part of an agenda. And, you know, at first we were real upset with Secretary Squire that she would be doing this. And then the more we started probing it and, and, and peeling the onion back and getting to what's really going on here, it's pretty clear that this is very similar to what's been done in other states, much like... Uh, Education Secretary Hannah Scandera's efforts 
are parallel to what was done in other states. This is all part of a concerted national strategy that involves privatizing prisons, schools, and health care. And that's what we're seeing here, is the privatization of our behavioral health system so that private companies can make as much money as they possibly can squeeze out of it, even if that involves reducing services. PCG, I think, was selected um, at the request of uh, the governor's office, possibly Keith Gardner, who is the governor's um, chief of staff. Uh, we have some reason to believe that that request was made last fall to Optum, that they take a look at this device that, that uh, PCG had developed, this computer program that was going to catch fraud even when nobody else had been able to catch it, and that they had used in North Carolina, and that they had used in some other states, all Republican-run states. I think it really is part of an ALEC or similar group National Republican Governors Association, who knows where it actually came from. But I think when Gardner was exposed to this, he thought, this is a great idea. We could do this in New Mexico. Here's how we get rid of these troublesome nonprofits. And here's why I call them troublesome. Almost all of them were developed in an era of advocating for their clientele. These are not agencies that take a refusal from the managed care company lightly. They'll fight it. They'll appeal it. They'll go to legislators and say, look what they're doing to these clients. Look what they're doing to us. They're, they're, they're squeezing our reimbursements. They're refusing services. And this just causes trouble for the managed care companies whose full focus should be devoted to making profit, they think. So I think this is what was really going on, that, that PCG got identified nationally as having a, a, a technique a computerized, uh, uh, what they do is they sample, and they claim that this really gets at it. But, but you know, we haven't been able to see what they've done, so we don't know if it's a good sampling technique or not. There are people of our committee with a lot more uh, data information experience, uh, information technology experience, to say it's all hokum, you know, it's all bogus. There, there's really no way you could get to these numbers from what they do. But they've sold enough Republican governors on it that it's now becoming a very profitable sidelight for them. And it's just a sidelight, but that's what they do. And so Gardner said to Optum, or God, Gardner said to Squire, talk to Optum and get them to take a look at this and have them you know, run, this, uh, run an audit of, of these troublesome nonprofits. I bet we catch some fraud. Not only do they catch some fraud, they, they figure they've caught all 15 in fraud. This is the rationale for what was already decided in advance, that these 15 would not be part of centennial care. That's what this is about, keeping them out of the next type of managed care in the state, the next way of paying for behavioral health. None of these 15 will be able to be in it, because even if they're cleared, a lot of them will be out of existence, and their names will be so besmirched that they really will not be able to contract with the big national companies running the behavioral health under centennial care. So two questions. I'd, I'd really like you to talk a little bit more about what happens to the personnel, the founders, the workers, uh, the clinicians at these nonprofits. But before we go there, I am really curious as a member of the legislature, what do you think should happen, let's say, if this um, uh, BCG audit proves to be grossly miscalculated and grossly wrong, mm -hmm. what happens to that company? Uh, and can any of, the, any of the nonprofits recover? Will that company be chased down and sued for ruining an entire network, or for at least being a part of it? It would be tough. I mean, it really would be tough. The, the lawyers for this company, or the attorney general, if he suddenly decides, you know, he's been um, uh, jerked around and played for a puppet in this, and he realizes that this was really a, a part of a concerted effort to misrepresent what was going on in the state. If he were to take that stance, maybe they would be able to ta tackle PCG for what they've done. 
but they would have to prove in court that it wasn't just an honest computing error, that it wasn't, uh, you know, like climate change, you know. Our scientists say this was good, your scientists say it was, that kind of thing. Yeah. It, it, it becomes then very, very difficult. Um, it's almost like they're going to get away with this no matter what, because by the time the attorney general finishes his investigation, by the time the state auditor finishes his investigation, it's going to be too late for most of these agencies, I think. It's too late for some of them already. They've had to go bankrupt or close shop. Um, but PCG has another contract in this state, and some of their subsidiaries have other contracts. They have a subsidiary called P PPL, or yeah, PPL, that just has been managing the uh, one of the one component of the MIVIA Medicaid waiver program for the Department of Health. And that subsidiary, three years ago, was found to have overbilled, and was charged by the state with, uh, you know, with uh, having to pay back all this money. And they appealed, and they kept on working, and they kept getting reimbursed during the appeal. And ultimately, this January. They settled, and they had to pay a ten thousand dollar reimbursement, <laughs> you know, peanuts. But they kept their contract. A month later, PCG got the big contract to do this audit. Three months after that, in May of this year, PCG was hired by the new health insurance exchange to manage the state's health insurance exchange. Oh They're going to be our managers. This is to me like like. Uh, like turning over your, it's not like foxes guarding the hen house. This is like setting up your hen house in the lion's den to see if any of them survive. I mean, these guys have no reason to make sure the health insurance exchange functions well, but they've been given that ex that contract. I, I, I'm really pessimistic for how the health insurance exchange will operate under their aegis because their track record is not great. How effective is the managed care approach to behavioral health? Yeah, to, to get at that, to answer that question, you really have to start with how managed care is supposed to work in physical health. And then we've, we've tried to apply it by analogy to behavioral health. And I think it's, it's, a, it's an inept application. Um, in, in physical health, you, the way managed care is supposed to work is you give the managed care company the universe of money available, and then they manage it. And it's to their benefit to give early services when inoculations or early screenings uh, to try to intervene quickly before the condition deteriorates into a more serious condition that would require surgery or hospitalization or a lifetime of, of uh, drug therapy. And so it really does have have a, a certain um, uh, integrity to it, that if you, if you take your money and use it wisely up front, you'll actually save money in the long run, and you should be reimbursed for making that savings, and so you get a percentage of what you've saved. There's the incentive. That's the theory, at least, behind it. It hasn't worked all that well in physical health either, but at least, at least there's an integrity there. You save money in the long run. Here's the problem with applying that same model to behavioral health. If you don't intervene early in behavioral health, you don't necessarily pay the cost later on. Mm. You don't provide the alcohol treatment that you should have. That guy gets into a wreck driving DWI. He doesn't come back to you for you to pay the price. He goes into prison. And the prison system will pay the price. He goes to court, and the court system will pay the price. Or he goes to on probation, and the probation system. Not the mental health people that served him. So the, and similarly, if, if you don't intervene early with this kid, and the kid gets, you know, becomes increasingly difficult, he winds up in special ed, not necessarily in a program that you provide. Yeah. You get to pick and choose what you invest in, and then somebody else pays the cost. It's a little bit like mining. You know? <laughs> somebody else is going to pay the cost and clean it up afterwards. So the hospitals and the jails, you know, the state hospital and the, and the jails of the counties and the state, the prisons, and the special ed programs, and the um, homeless shelters, these are the ones that are going to pay the cost for your saving and scrimping and, and not actually providing good services up front. 
the only way managed care works, I think, in behavioral health is when you make it a state-run system. Then you can shift costs within the state. The prison system says, here's the bill, managed care system, for the two people that you should have this month that we took into jail, for the two people that you were treating and you did such an inept job that they wound up in prison. So you need to shift some of your budget over to us. Then it starts having some, or, or, or the schools can tap the budget of this to provide the services. But if you keep these little independent silos or kingdoms and their independent budgets apart, the managed care, and you turn it over to a for-profit company, that for-profit company has every incentive not to provide service. This is why we went from 12 hospitals in Albuquerque. And in, interestingly, you know, we had those in the mid-90s. It was like 94, 95. We had 12 inpatient psychiatric hospitals in Albuquerque. I don't know if we needed 12 inpatient psychiatric hospitals in Albuquerque, but we had a lot. As soon as they put in managed care, they all had to close because they would never get approval to pave the treatment. Or they might have somebody admitted they'd get one or two days, but they could never do a, a full regimen. We used to have an uh, average length of stay would be about 10 or 12 days. They'd stabilize. They'd go to a few group meetings. They'd try to have meetings with their families. They'd figure out what they needed to do to avoid being rehospitalized, and then they'd be released. As soon as managed care came in, they started saying, no, no, do, deal with that on an outpatient basis. Deal with that... Um, by going to AA meetings. Deal with that by going to NA meetings, Narcotics Anonymous. Deal with that by, here's a support group that doesn't cost us any money. You go to that and see if that does. How about going to your church pastor? They would just shift the cost off to everybody else and never have to actually pay for what was needed by that family or by that client. And so we lost, first we lost the hospitals. Then we lost the residential treatment programs. We're down now, I think... At that time, we had about 200 residential treatment beds in the state. I don't think we have 25 now for adolescents who are acting out. Uh, we had group homes. We had about 12 group homes all over the state. Oh, Goddess alone ran th you know, three or four group homes here. YDI had a group home. None of those exist anymore. They've all been wiped out. We had um, uh, treatment foster care. It was the fastest growing part of the whole treatment sp spectrum. And they were putting more and more kids into treatment foster care because it's relatively cheap. You put two kids in a treatment foster care home, pay the home $25,000 a year for each kid, and that's a teeny fraction of what you'd be paying for inpatient or even for residential treatment. But eventually they decided, gee, we can even skimp on that and pay a counselor to see the kid once a week and have the kid live at home where he gets no support when he's still, you know... Uh, stops going to school when he still acts out in all the ways he was acting out before. It doesn't really solve problems. It just saves money. And that money then is translated into profit for the managed care company. I think it's an insidious, very dangerous way of shifting the costs of behavioral health onto other parts of our state system. And we ought to be resisting it instead of just turning it over to these four managed care companies. Well, this is a grim but incredibly enlightening story that we've heard today, Jerry, and I'm terribly grateful to have you here. I know that you're a, a big supporter of a constitutional amendment to, uh, uh, to work on early childhood education and other things, and I'd love to have you come back to the Mercury one day and, and explain that amendment to us, too. That would be very interesting. I would love to do that. It's one of the things that I think offers some hope a way of beginning to, to grapple with some of the issues before the kids start manifesting problems. If we could get them really good early care and set them on the right path. I think uh, you were mentioning earlier about the impact of, of hunger on brain development. Well, it's the same thing emotionally. The, the emotional hunger that some kids feel never leaves them throughout life. And those are the kids that get into, if they don't wind up in homeless shelters or they don't wind up in drug programs, they frequently wind up in prison. Uh, our, large, our behavioral health system in the state has largely become our jails and prisons. That's really not the appropriate way of dealing with this. But if we could prevent those problems from ever developing, we'd have a chance of getting ahead of the curve.